pretty excited about the Missouri portfolio. A uh, lot of really exciting things going on here. Um, we'll jump in and kind of talk about the details of the four communities we already are buying and uh, maybe touch on a couple others we're eyeing for this portfolio. Um, but first, just a quick confidentiality and disclaimer that I think most of you are uh, familiar with. The idea is that this is a private placement memorandum. So anybody that um, joins or sees this, we just need to be aware of. So if you've got friends or family, we're obviously we love when you share that. Just uh, also make sure we know because we we legally have to know when people are looking at or people are investing or uh, looking at the materials. Um, so quick agenda, we'll go through the highlights of the deal and talk about the team that's putting it together and working on it. And then we'll kind of give us some quick background on uh, why mobile home communities are a good investment, kind of how they work with the financials. Um, we'll go relatively quick on that part because I know a lot of you already know about that. Then we'll dive in and talk about the actual communities and then we'll talk about our business plan and how we're going to increase the value. So Ryan and I uh, formed Suncrest Capital. We'll talk a little bit more about our partnership in a second, but Brian, uh, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm the chief operating officer at Suncrest Capital. Um, background is 13 years experience as a residential real estate agent before jumping over to the commercial space a little over two years ago, uh, purchasing my first mobile home community. Uh, so my job is essentially to, to maximize operational efficiency and occupation uh, in the community's occupancy as we uh, continue to scale. I work directly with the park managers and provide support and guidance to them. And I do a lot of work on the background with municipalities, the cities that our, our uh, communities are in as well, uh, just working to develop positive relationships with them. There's, there's a lot of hurdles to kind of uh, clear with, with cities, uh, with the mobile home communities. Uh, father of two great kids, lucky husband, uh, to a great supportive wife. And I just love the, the mobile home community space. Thanks, Ryan. Um, hey, I think I know most people on the call, but I've uh, come from a tech and finance background, um, done a lot of uh, corporate finance, especially with large, large, hairy projects. So when I look at distress mobile home communities, that's what gets me excited because I like the hairy stuff that nobody else wants to work on because I like to fix it. Um, so for our partnership, I mostly focus on uh, all the like financial, legal stuff, uh, as well as some of the larger corporate, or I'm sorry, capital projects. Um, and then we have a great team of co-GPs that are gonna be helping us out. So I'll let Matt start us off with the intros on that. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Hall. Um, I've been investing in real estate since I'd say the early 2000s. I've invested in single family, multifamily on both the East Coast and the Midwest. I currently live on the West Coast. Um, I have also have some uh, experience buying real estate and businesses when I worked overseas for about 10 years. I've been working with Brett and Ryan and Suncrest Capital for the past several months. And uh, I've teamed up with Brett and done a lot of the underwriting for the deal that, for the portfolio that we're gonna show today. And I'd say we worked on the, a lot of underwriting for many other deals that we passed on as well. Uh, and you know, as we move forward, I'm likely gonna be supporting a lot of the bookkeeping, finance managing, and working alongside Ryan to ensure that we're hitting budgets and ensuring op operational excellence in our parks. Thanks, Matt. Karthik? Hey folks, uh, my name is Karthik and I've been working for Apple for close to 10 years now. The one thing that got interested in working with mobile home communities is the cash flow. Everybody loves cash. Um, and my focus is to bring my technical skills and project management um, um, skills to minimize the cost and then infill um, the ohms which much better returns. So that will be my focus um, for this mobile home community. I'm glad to be part of this group and looking for uh, much better deals. Thanks, Karthik. And Brandon, to finish us off. Hey, y'all. Brandon here. Uh, super excited to see you all and be here with you today. Um, I'm a realtor in Atlanta, Georgia, also a residential property investor. And uh, I will mostly be supporting the team here at Suncrest with infill and some CapEx projects. Again, really excited to be here and thank you all. Great. 
All right. Our, we have a, a really strong regional team. So husband and wife team, uh, Kristen and Doug Hensley. Uh, Kristen has, she's managed uh, since my first park a little over two years ago. And is uh, she's, she and Doug are the regional and project managers for our, we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit, but our Iowa portfolio as well. So uh, in fact, Kristen and Brett just finished um, a, a full day training with our Iowa uh, managers. So she, she's meeting with them weekly, um, meeting with us weekly. So she's the conduit between our, our uh, community managers and us. And Doug has an extensive background and he has his, uh, his own um, uh, commercial like contracting, remodeling, uh, business as well as an inspection business for commercial and residential. So he oversees a lot of our larger capital improvement projects. Uh, and uh, we've got Brandon Gilmore. He's on the call. I know. We'll, so Brandon, I promise we'll get you a slide in our next, in our next presentation. So he's in charge of our re rehab crew. So they are busy at work in Iowa right now. They're they're rehabbing um, at least four of our. Uh, vacant homes, getting them ready for sale. So as soon as the Missouri parks close, he's going to have a team and boots on the ground there uh, going to work on, on uh, homes that need rehabbing there as well. So just give you an idea of the communities that um, Suncrest has ownership in. So we're both Brett and I live in Boise, Idaho area. So we, we have two up in Sun Valley. Um, we have our Iowa portfolio. So we have four in Iowa that we're, we're super excited about as well. Uh, three in the Kansas City metro area. And then we'll be talking in detail about our, uh, our Missouri portfolio, which you see down at the bottom right. So another thing we're pretty excited about, and Grant, I talked to you about this a little bit, but we recently became Verivest verified. So if you haven't heard of Verivest, it's a good one to just look up verivest.com. They're essentially a company that specializes in verifying and doing third-party background checks for people that do sponsor, sponsor private placement memorandums. So um, what we like about that is it just is kind of one extra layer of, of, uh, of, I guess scrutiny that our investors can feel comfortable that we're we're sharing, we're opening up our books. Um, we have this third party that's actually looking through all of our accounting. They've already done all the background checks on us. And so essentially what they do the reporting on is our sponsors actually doing what they say they're doing and you know, not letting people get away with anything. So that's a really um, cool thing we just started doing. <clears throat> so going into the portfolio. So yeah, and I'll talk a little bit about the returns, and then we'll jump into the actual communities in the business plan uh, in a little bit, but we wanted to give some highlights first. So a couple of things on the left. So 8% preferred return. What this means is before anyone else can get paid in the project, whether it's uh, us as the sponsors or um, other investors, the, the investors in the deal have to get 8% preferred return. So for example, if we want an entire year where the cash flow, because because these are turnaround projects, if we had to go an entire year without paying out any cash flow to investors, that eight percent would accrue and still be due. So we would have to catch up on that eight percent first, and then we could pay out other returns. And then above that eight percent, we'll pay seventy percent. We'll go to uh, investors first, and thirty percent will be shared with the general partnership and uh, other partners in the deal. Um, this is different from other deals we've done in the past. Uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback that. Um, investors want to see, make sure that we have uh, alignment of issues, uh, interest. I think that's the big thing for all of us, really. So the way this is structured is the lion's share will go to our investors first, that 8% again, and then everything above that, 70% will go to investors. And then once we have really stabilized and proven the value and hit a 20% IRR, then we'll share 50-50. So again, that gives us even more alignment of interest to make sure that we're performing as best as possible on this. So we're averaging uh, about 12% returns, cash on cash, that is. You'll notice at the bottom, if you look at the cash flow, we're projecting year one. We're actually projecting cash flow returns to be better than 4,000, 4, but we wanted to hold back returns for the first six months. And we'll talk a little bit in a moment why that's a strategic decision to make sure we have cash on hand to increase the value of the portfolio right away. So essentially six months in, we'll start paying the preferred returns. So this assumes we're able to pay back 
just half of that preferred, uh, even though we're, we're projecting we should be able to do more than that. Um, so 4,000 the first year, and then we get up to 9% and then continue to progress up until we do that cash out refi. We have an internal rate of return of 21%. What, what this means is there's a lot of different ways to compare returns, but what's nice about an internal rate of return is it takes into account the time. So for example, if I just skip over to their equity multiple, we're forecasting that if you invest $100,000, you'll receive a total of $359,000 over a 10 year hold. That's adding up all of this cash that's been returned each year. It's also adding up the principal return you'll get in year five when we do a refinance. So in year five, for example, we get $112,000 back with the refinance. So full return of capital plus the cash flow from operations of 12,000. So that year alone, you're getting about 124,000 is the projection. And then if you add in the sale, you'll also get about a 140 is what we're projecting. So all of those numbers add up to be about 359,000 on a $100,000 investment. So coming back to the internal rate of return, if you got no cash flow for an entire 10 years and then all of it came in year 10, that would technically be the same returns, but the internal rate of return would be very different because you're not seeing that cash flow over time. So being able to see that cash flow over time allows you to reinvest in and multiply your returns even more. So that's why that's a really strong indicator and in being able to compare apples to apples with other projects or investments. Um, so I already kind of touched on the equity multiple. This is just kind of a simple, how's that return? Um, and then we are looking at a 10 year hold and we'll talk a little bit more about why we're doing a 10 year hold. That is also a strategic decision. All right, we'll get into the, the whys. Um, you know, there's a lot of smart money in mobile home communities. Um, a lot of investors I've spoken to, uh, even over the last few months, are starting to pull their money out of stock market, maybe not all of it, but looking for more stable assets uh, like mobile home communities. And like Karthik said, they, they, they cash flow very well. Um, you know, we've got billionaires, Warren Buffett, he owns Clayton Homes, largest mobile home manufacturer in the US and operates the two largest mobile home lenders, 21st Mortgage and Vanderbilt. Um, and then Sam Zell, he's the largest owner of uh, mobile home communities in the U.S. Uh, so they're both heavily invested, and this is why. Uh, supply and demand is, is a big reason. So there's roughly 65 million Americans that live in poverty, and the demand for safe, affordable housing's really never been higher. Uh, there's roughly 40 to 45,000 total mobile home communities in the entire country uh, and, and about 100 of them a year are being shut down, closed down, redeveloped into commercial apartments or retail, and just about 10 new ones either being built or significantly added onto. So, so the supply is going down and the demand keeps going up. Uh, they're re recession resistant. So, you know, mobile home communities are essentially the bottom rung of, of housing. So that means the compression of everyone moving down as, as home and rent prices go up. Um, there's more and more demand for it and so, coupled with a dwindling supply. Um, so I did, I read during COVID-19 uh, and we're still in COVID obviously, but uh, the mobile home uh, community returns were the highest performing asset in commercial uh, real estate. So most operators were reporting about a 95% collection versus 50 to 70% collection for retail and apartments during like the heart of all the shutdowns. Uh, so they're, they're strong recession resistant assets. Uh, significant ta tax benefits. Um, they were surprising to me, it might be surprising to you. So uh, so you know, we're, we're gonna be doing a, um, a, a study. It's a cost segregation study in year one, which should uh, protect a significant percentage of your investment funds um, on the tax side of things. So depreciation for mobile home communities is about 15 is 15 years compared to apartments or 27 and a half years, commercial properties, 39 years. And we'll get the majority of that um, within the first year after we do that study so we can protect uh, taxes on your investment. Uh, forced depreciation, what's really cool about, about these as well as our Iowa portfolio, that a lot of infill. So when we say infill, that means vacant uh, vacant pads, vacant lots that we bring homes into. And so essentially how, how the valuation of these mobile home communities works with the, the cap rate compression, that a, a new home that you add into a community can increase the value 50 to $60,000 for each home. 
uh, just based on, on lot rent. So Matt will talk a little bit more about uh, opportunities of uh, increasing our lot count as well. And surprisingly, uh, mobile homes are not so mobile. Uh, once they're in place, 80% of them never move again. Um, it's expensive to move a, a mobile home. So, you know, three to $5,000 to, for someone to move it. And, and our residents don't tend to have that type of cash laying around um, uh, to move them. So also low tenant turnover. So only about 10 to 15% annually versus almost 50% for apartments, about 47% for apartments. So our tenants tend to be sticky. They, they stick around uh, the homes. They, they stay as well. So a lot of advantages uh, for mobile home communities. All right, great. So Ryan talked to you a little bit about the advantages of uh, investing in mobile home communities. I'm going to continue to build on that theme and talk a little bit about how mobile home parks cash flow, how you determine the value of a, a mobile home park. And then finally, like provide a little understanding about um, how adding homes to the parks can really dramatically increase the value. And Ryan just touched on that a little bit. So in this slide, we have like two extremely um, simplified versions of P&Ls, one for traditional real estate and one for mobile home communities. Um, and I also recognize that you know, some of the terms in here could be potentially new for some people, but bear with me, I'll you know, kind of do my best to explain. So on the left side, when we have traditional real estate, um, you have you have uh, income from the, say rent that you would get and expenses for the property that you have. Um, you you um, subtract the expenses from the income and what you get is the net operating income. And then after that, you would, you would subtract your debt service from um, your net operating income. And the debt service is essentially just the mortgage for the property. And once you subtract the mortgage, that's the cash flow. So, that, so if you own traditional real estate, that's the cash that you get in your hand once you pay that debt service. Mobile home communities, it's slightly different and, and pretty cool actually. Um, just like traditional real estate, there's the income and expenses. Now the income in mobile home communities comes from the lot rents. So all of the different lots we're receiving rent for and there's overall expenses for the park itself, you know, so you subtract the income, the expenses from the income, and then that's your net operating income or your NOI. Um, then you subtract the debt service or we subtract our mortgage from that. But then with mobile home communities, there's one additional like kind of bonus income that we can also experience as well. And that, that is that there are homes that are on these pads that we're getting rent from, but some of those homes are owned by the actual tenant and some of them are owned by the park. So the ones that are owned by the park, many of them are paying off, um, are, are buying that home slowly from us. They're essentially almost getting a mortgage from us. So we're, we're uh, collecting that extra home income for the houses that are, they are going through this lease to own program to buy from us. So then ultimately after that, that's how we would get the cash flow for our mobile home communities. Next slide. I'm gonna go to the next slide. So then, so then, um, so now, now we kind of talk, how do we go about valuing mobile home communities? So first, um, you know, as, as I was talking about before, you take the net operating income, again, and that wouldn't include the home income, but you take the net operating income and you would divide it by the cap rate or the capitalization rate. Now, what is the capitalization rate? Um, the capitalization rate is like this relatively objective metric that's used to determine the value of uh, many times like commercial real estate. Uh, and a cap rate can change uh, based on say the quality the size, the location, and the relative risk of a piece of real estate. So for example, go to the next slide. So for example, um, with, uh, you know, what, what I've done here is used um, our, our uh, this portfolio example of what we expect in year five, right? So in year five, we expect an NOI or net operating income of about $442,000. 
if we are to divide that um, divide it by the cap rate of seven percent, which is, you know, uh, which is in line with other types of parks of that quality, size, location, and risk, we would expect the relative value of our park to be about six point three million dollars at that point. So then, let's go to the next slide. So then, finally. Um, you know, using this type of math, what we can also do is talk about what happens to the value of a park once you add homes. So, and this is what Ryan was alluding to. When we, when we add a park, when we can add a home to one of our parks and we're able to increase the monthly NOI through that new rent that we would be getting by adding in that home, we can, in, we, um, like we can increase the value of the park and the examples below. So say our NOI increases by $300 per month. We multiply that by 12 months, that's $3,600 uh, $3, annually that we would receive. You divide that by that 7% cap rate I talked about, you're adding $51,000 worth of value by adding in a home and collecting that extra rent, right? So when you add in these homes, you the value of the property can, can um, go up anywhere between, between say 40 to 60 K. And you think about maybe like the $20,000 that it would cost us to infill that home, you know, buy a home and fill it, sell it. Like, like it's, it's difficult to think of really any other asset class that really provides great returns like that. Um, and, and as to this infill, I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about that later as I go talk about the rest of the properties. Next slide. All right, everybody. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the market. Um, the markets actually have me and the rest of the team here really excited. So we have two major markets here. The first is Springfield. The other one is the Branson MSA. Now Springfield's definitely bigger than Branson, but the cool thing about them is that they're so close to one another that they, they overlap essentially, and the strengths of each are are shared among each other. So while Springfield is the big major metro here, um, it's actually the third largest in Missouri. It is, um, it is full of excellent schools. All these universities on the right here are there in Springfield. Um, it has a really rapidly growing economy. It has a vibrant downtown and um, as you can see, the population is pretty significant, 455,000. We like that a lot. Median income, 43,000. That's great too. What we really, really love about these markets is the medium single family home price. So it's $156,000. Um, this means that there's a lot of people looking for affordable housing and there's a lot of people who will pay for a mobile home and to live in a mobile home versus having to go and pay for single family home. And just stressing that, um, Brennan, if, if we look at a market and the single family homes are only 80,000, we compete, mobile homes compete much more with the single family home than they do with an apartment. It, which when I first got in, that, that shocked me. I thought the first thing I was looking at was, well, how much can I rent a thousand square foot home for versus a thousand square foot mobile home? And that's not the case really, it's, it's very different. Part of that's because you get home ownership, you can pull right up to your house, you get no neighbors that are right sharing your walls. There's a lot of advantages for mobile homes that the apartments don't have. So if you look at single family income or home prices that are only 80,000 and it costs 40,000 you're selling a mobile home for, it's, it's a lot harder that there's not a gap there. So with $160,000 medium single family home price that we're competing against, and in some of the communities it's even higher than that in the neighboring uh, homes, um, we can sell nicer fifty, sixty thousand dollars homes there without any challenge. So that's kind of what Brennan's referring to there. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much, Brett. Um, this is just some U.S. Census Bureau data for the Springfield MSA. Uh, as you can see, population growth uh, has been really good over the past uh, couple decades. Um, also, household income growth has been great too. You know, jobs drive population growth. If income's growing, 
job market's growing, population is going to grow. And that means we have more people that want to live in our parks. Um, median house value, as we talked about earlier, um, it's also growing. Um, this is the data is taken from a different spot than the other one, but they're, it's great to see that this median home value is shooting up lately because that means more and more people are gonna to wanna to buy a mobile home in our parks, right? Branson MSA, um, it's, a, it's a little different than the Springfield MSA, but it still benefits from being so close to Springfield and being close to a really major MSA. As you can see, population definitely lower. Um, median income is actually only a little bit lower and single family home price is right about the same. So we're still getting those benefits of people looking for an affordable way to live. Um, Branson's actually really cool. It's uh, a popular tourist destination. It's uh, gone in US news as being one of the uh, best weekend getaways in the Midwest. There's a lot of different things to do here. It's sort of like the gateway to the Ozarks. There's tons of hiking, tons of outdoor things to do, but then there's also 50 different theaters in Branson, there's multiple amusement parks. So just tons of things for people to do from around the country and it attracts uh, a lot of business and a lot to the economy. This is the Census Bureau data. Um, I took it for Taney County uh, because there was a error with the um, Branson MSA data. But Taney County is the county that uh, Branson is in. And as you can see, we've got really solid population growth for Branson as well. We have um, not quite a solid medium home value growth. It doesn't appear, but in the short term, we've seen really good medium home value growth. Um, Brett, next slide. And the top employers, um, we really love what we're seeing in Springfield and Branson. Uh, we like to see, you know, health, education, government as the main employers. It's also fantastic to see big companies like Walmart, Bass Pro Shops. This is pretty much what you see here, here is the ideal main employers for any market. Uh, Branson is pretty much the same. It's just sprinkled with uh, tourist uh, companies and uh, things of that nature. Thanks, Brett. All right, so it's uh, back to me for the uh, portfolio overview. Um, as Brendan uh, described, you know, he described uh, Springfield, Missouri, and Branson, Missouri, and that's right around where our parks are. So we have Rolling Meadows down by um, in the south there, there down by Branson, Missouri, and then the three other parks that we're looking at are Suburban Acres and Cedar Lane. And you can see um, where this entire area is relative to Kansas City. It's, you know, between a two and a half to three hour drive from KC to get down to Springfield. Um, you know, for, for this, but, you know, uh, for the underwriting that we did for this deal, um, we mainly focused on well, what we underwrote it for Suburban Acres, Cedar Lane, and Rolling Meadows. Um, Fairfield has actually just been recently offered to us and we're considering adding it to the portfolio. And I would say if and only if the project returns that we project will be at par or better than the returns that Brett described uh, earlier in the talk. Um, the good thing about it is, is if we are able to make the deal for Fairfield Acres based on the financing, we should be able to buy it without any additional capital. So ultimately, you know, the returns would get even better by adding this to the portfolio. Um, as for the, you know, just as for the different locations, you know, Rolling Meadows is a, you know, it's a B, it's a B minus B property for us. And then Cedar Lane and Suburban Acres are more of those kind of hairy and distressed type properties that Brett had spoken about, but you know, that's where we see the, that's where we see value and opportunity. The next one, Brett. So th this is, this is actually some images from um, Rolling Meadows. That's the park I was describing down South that is uh, near Branson, Missouri. 
Um, you can see that this park has obvious pride and ownership that is absolutely pervasive throughout the park. People care about their homes and the, and, and the community that they, that they live in, right? Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, you know, Cedar Lane, Suburban Acres, they're, they're not quite up to the standard. Um, but as we go in and we do infill in those sites, we renovate different aspects of the park. This is definitely, you know, the, the type of feel that we want to be able to emulate in all of our communities. And I would even say in Rolling Meadows, it has some work to do as well. Um, you know, we plan to put a vinyl fence around uh, a vinyl fence around the pool that you see here. And there's a clubhouse just to the right of that pool. And we tend to we intend to go in and renovate and um, and paint the exterior of it to, so we can create a create a, a nice uh, community, a uh, nice place for the community to enjoy. Um, uh, next, I think, yeah, okay. So this is the portfolio under overview. And like this snapshot right here, like to me really, you know, looking at these numbers really tells me why I love this investment and honestly why I think the team loves this investment. And because what we can see is upside, right? What it suggests you know, you can see that across the portfolio, we have 223 lots. Only 130 of them are um, have either tenant owned or leased to own tenants. So 30 of so 130 of those are filled. That is a lot of infill opportunity for us. And as I described earlier, when we have infill opportunity, we can dramatically increase the value of the parks. Now, I don't want to like, I don't, I don't want to kid anyone. We know it's going to be a lot of work as well. But what I am absolutely confident in is that we have the team here, here and on the ground, like Ryan to talk to, have the capability and more importantly, the experience to be able to take advantage of this upside. Um, the other upside is actually quite simple. It's uh, the lot rents, right? The, the lot rents are... Um, they are relatively, I mean, they are below market, the, the lot rents are below market value. Um, and this is, the reason this is because some of these parks have been a, some combination of ignored or mismanaged, right? So um, we, will, we will have the opportunity to go in and raise the rents here. You raise the rents, you increase the NOI, ultimately you're increasing the value of the parks as well. Um, these are like really the main reasons why we picked these particular parks. And I can tell you how many parks we had passed on where we did not see this type of upside. Um, you can also see that we're going to be able to build back the sewer and the water. And then finally, um, you know, Brendan really talked, you know, talked about this. So, you know, the, the median uh, single family home price really ticks the, ticks the mark for us. You know, we typically want to see at least $100,000. So, that's easily seen in, in all of these locations. And then the median income is right around where we'd like to see it as well, around 35 to $40,000 per year. Um, this is just a quick breakdown of, you know, I was talking about the resident owned versus the lease to own and then the vacant lots, homes to rehab. So you can see over time, we would expect that blue portion of the bar of the circle to get smaller and then the orange and yellow to get larger. And ultimately what we wanna do is have as many kind of resident owned properties as possible because the more resident owned properties you have, um, it's more people that actually own their home. They, they know that they're gonna live there and they really take pride in their community. So that's the, that's the, that's the direction that we're ultimately gonna be moving in. And then next slide. And then finally, I just wanted to kind of show like a, this real life example of this infill that I was talking about. So this is Rolling Meadows and um, we have the opportunity to infill 42 lots here. And you can see in like the Southern part of the map, you know, a lot of vacant spaces down there. And again, we saw this and we was like, this is, this is why we wanna, this is why we wanna, um, you know, purchase this property. I'd also say you can see even um, there's even some more infill that we're going to do on the east side of the map. I noted those in purple. Um, in order to infill over there, what we're going to need to do is we're going to like have to 
do a little bit more work and spend a little bit more money, but we have baked all of that in, in into the into the model that we put together because there's a lot of brush that we have to clear. But in general, like there's already utilities and um, so there's electric and plumbing run to all of those sites. We just need to clear it out and we need to extend that Edgewood Road. So we have to ex extend a north-south road over there, but then we're gonna get eight extra properties. So once again, you know, adding this infill increases the value and that's, you know, why we love this, why we love this portfolio. Uh, next, All that's right. next to you, Ryan. Yep. And I, I just add on to what Matt was sharing with, with the, uh, the lot rents, uh, the market lot rents, uh, somebody asked a question there. Um, we, we call around, we pull other communities, um, in the, in the area, uh, see what the average, uh, lot rent is for a similar type of property. And then for what the property, uh, would be able to achieve once we get it to the quality we're looking for. And we believe that those are, um, very conservative on the, on the market rent. Uh, I think the other thing I wanted to share is we, I don't think we've ever written it underwritten a deal where we've taken it straight to market because generally we're buying properties that are 50 to hundred dollars below. And I, I just think it's really challenging to increase rents that much and keep your tenants. And it's, you know, I think we, we've had some moral discussions about that too, uh, mm -hmm. honestly. So what we like to see is there's a lot of room to grow and then be conservative about the growth because our priority is actually the infill. So if we can be a top quality community with really competitive rents, and we're adding more more homes to it, it's going to be a lot easier for us to bring in new new residents while we uh, fill up the park, which is where the value is. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So so it's not day one. We're not jumping the rents from where they are to market rent for sure. Um, the this is affordable housing. People are on fixed income, low income. Um, you know, we're, we're wary of that and, and understanding of that. So, yeah, we've been, we were fairly conservative in how we wrote that into the underwriting. We're going to do that, you know, over time and not right away. Yep. Uh, one, one step that we feel is very important. We do this early on in our due diligence is test the, the demand for, for housing. Um, so the, uh, you know, like Facebook marketplace is the main place that people are looking for housing now. So the, it's kind of, it, it is the new Craigslist where, you know, five plus years ago, everything was on Craigslist. Now pretty much everything's on, on the Facebook marketplace. So we put these test ads out, uh, see, see what kind of uh, traffic we get. Um, we have uh, over on the far right, it's a Google form that we ask potential um, renters to, to fill out. So part of it is we're, we're advertising, we're gonna, we're gonna, we'll have these homes available around when we're planning on close these. So one, we're testing demand and two, we're actually building um, a list of potential uh, buyers and residents. And so we have a series of questions uh, for if they, you know, if they're looking to, to purchase or to lease to own. Uh, that type of thing. Inevitably, even though you, you have good directions in that Facebook ad, people usually hit the, is this still available button? And so from that, we just direct them back to the Facebook, or, or I'm sorry, to the Google form to, to fill out. So what we're looking for in this test ad is, um, you know, 10 interactions outside of the views and outside of the, is, is this still available on, uh, on Facebook? indicates a pretty strong demand for, for housing uh, within a week, like within seven days. So that breaks down to about one and a half a day, like filling out that Google form or three in, in 24 hours. So both of these tests, I, I shut them down after 24 hours because of the, the high demand. So these were both 24 hour tests. Um, the first two are just more information. The, the bigger piece is the, the bottom one, the total Google Forms completed. So people taking the time to fill out uh, their information, um, additional information about themselves, what they're looking for, their ideal move-in date, all of that. So the demand in both areas was, was super strong. 
Jumping into the business plan, uh, we debated on how detailed to be here. So I apologize if some of you were thinking, whoa, this is too much information. But we wanted to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit and tell you what we're, what we're planning to do with these communities. So I've broken it up to two categories. So the orange-ish are our, our Fairfield, Cedar Lane, and Suburban Acres, which are all distressed turnaround projects. And then Rolling Meadows, which is really great condition with some upside where we can do some improvements and also bring in some installs. So focusing on our on our upgrades. So we're planning to upgrade from a class D uh, communities to class B plus. So some of you that might be new to commercial real estate, you sort of hear these gradings between like F up to A and they're somewhat sub subjective. They're not, there's not like this exact criteria to it. Um, but generally speaking, I think most people would agree these are sort of in D shape for a number of reasons. Um, one question was asked about utilities. So this is where I want to talk about utilities. So Fairfield and uh, Cedar Lane um, both have public utilities. So they've got city water, city sewer. Uh, Suburban Acres is actually on a well and a septic system. And what we liked about that is we're buying it for cheaper uh, because most people don't want to buy that, but it's like literally feet from city, city sewer. So we've already got an engineering firm engaged. In fact, it's an engineering firm we've used up in Iowa that we're familiar with and have worked with in the past that's already given us bids and we're set to do that septic conversion. I jumped ahead, again, I guess, a little bit here. I've got that here in uh, year one, we'll be doing it in the spring. Um, as soon as the, the ground thaws there in Springfield from the winter, we're gonna do that conversion. Um, and so in Fairfield, uh, we're going to be basically all three of these communities. You can see the, the detail of all of them that are going to have to happen. So we need to evict some troubled tenants, remove old homes, rehab and sell um, any of the existing homes that are in good, good enough shape to keep. Uh, and then we'll also do a paint program that essentially people that own their own home that haven't maybe taken care of it. What we do is we'll provide the labor uh, and the paint, and then we essentially build back and give them a affordable option to pay back that upgrade of their exterior so that the whole neighborhood looks looks nice. So kind of gives them some skin in the game, but also gives them the advantage of, uh, of getting some cheaper options and much more easy. Uh, we get new landscaping. We also want to add in some small playgrounds. Each of these communities has small areas where we could add some value with the, the playgrounds. And actually, contrary to most uh, popular opinion, playgrounds don't really impact your insurance. So it's kind of a nice thing to add that doesn't really cost a lot to, to add it and it doesn't really impact our insurance costs. So we'll be doing that. Um, and then as I mentioned before, converting suburban acres to city sewer. And we'll also be upgrading our electrical infrastructure at two of the parks. So Fairfield and, C and I'm sorry, Fairfield and suburban acres both have 50 amps at their pedestals or at their sites. What that means is these were built long, long enough ago that the homes didn't really need the amperage and they relied more on gas. Nowadays, the newer homes need at least 100 amps if they've got gas, but really at that point, at, what, at the point you're upgrading 100, you might as well go all the way to 200, which gives you just so much more flexibility. Pretty much we'd be able to put any home in there and it'll dramatically increase the value of the community later on because people really wanna be buying parks that have 200 amps already because it is a pretty big headache to, to do the upgrade. So we've already got an electrical engineering uh, company working on the design for us now for Suburban Acres, and then we'll have the move over to Fairfield. So all of this, we're, we're getting kick-started before we even have bought the property so we can hit the ground running right away. Um, so we will do rent increases for Fairfield and Cedar Lane in spring once we've done the electric upgrades, some asphalt repairs, landscaping, paint program, all those things. But it's only we're only forecasting about a 10% increase, so not dramatic. Um, increase, but we did want that is bigger than we normally want to do. And part of that's because we want to upgrade the quality of the tenant base that's there too. So we do want to have just, we're doing a ton of value into those communities. We want to make sure that we've got the right tenant base there too. Um, and then just trying to skim through to see if I've got anything else in this orange section, but really within about 18 months, we'll have executed the business plan for the most part as far as turning around things. And then we're going to focus on infill. So we're hoping to get these communities to the point where we can bring in brand new to five, maybe 10 year old homes uh, into these communities and sell them because they can compete, like I said before, with those much more expensive uh, single family homes in the area. So rolling meadows right off the ground, what we can do is uh, paint the clubhouse, new pool fencing, just like a nice vinyl fencing. Um, there are a handful of homes in the community that we can go ahead and uh, rehab and sell. Um, 
and then we'll develop those eight new sites that Brand, that Matt walked us through, and then uh, we're planning on infilling five homes a year. So another question was how many homes are we going to be infilling? We've got a very conservative uh, benchmark for infill on in this portfolio, um, just five a year for Rolling Meadows and about two to five for the rest of the portfolio. So seven to 10 a year is what we're looking to do, less than one a month. And some of those will be brand new that we don't need to source off of uh, Facebook or other places that it can be, can be more competitive sometimes. Um, but finally, the other thing I wanna mention is Rolling Meadows has a high quality white wastewater treatment plant. So it has its own wastewater treatment plant. Um, What's fantastic about this is it's super cheap to run. And it's like, I mean, we were standing right on top of it. Good shape, smells just like you wouldn't even, you'd be surprised, you can't smell anything. Um, but again, it scares people. So people don't wanna buy a community that has a wastewater treatment plant in it. So we have met with the uh, local operator, met with the city, the district and the county have all toured this wastewater treatment plant with us. We've also had a civil engineering firm do a study on it. Like we're doing thorough due diligence on it. But the thing we're really uh, excited about is that the district, the wastewater district is already has it in their master plan and it's a public master plan to connect to, uh, to connect really meadows to the district, uh, district facilities. So in other words, over the, over the next five, 10 at the most, we're, we're planning on happening in nine to 10 years, but they, they told us it'll happen somewhere between five and 10 years it'll connect and it won't cost us anything due to the connection, which is fantastic because that'll immediately see a cap rate compression once that connects. Um, so that's part of the reason we want to keep the portfolio that long is to make sure we can realize that. Um, jumping in on infill strategy, uh, Ryan, I'll let you talk to this. You're on mute, Ryan. Thank you. Yep. Um, there's a good question we can address now is the question was, how do you evict a tenant that owns their home, but but not paying lot rent and can't afford to pay to move their home. So there's, there's some different strategies we can use for a cash for keys, offer to buy the home from them. Um, if it's a, a problem tenant, a sex offender, whatever it might be, that they, they're just not a good fit for the community and, and you go through the eviction process, that home typically will, will come back to the park and then you end up uh, rehabbing it, reselling it. Um, there's a variety of, of uh, steps you have to do in between that, but that's, that's uh, kind of the broad strokes of how that works. Um, our infill strategy, so seven plus used homes a year, uh, different channels of so Facebook marketplace. We've developed relationships with wholesalers that that's what they're doing all day is, is looking for homes. We also have a team of VAs or, or virtual assistants that are uh, uh, scouring Facebook marketplace, Craigslist. And they're looking for postings in, in Kansas, Missouri, Iowa. Um, the picture at the very bottom there, that's Matt and I. Uh, we developed a relationship with a dealership that was just down the road from uh, Cedar Lane. And in fact, purchased that beautiful three bed, two bath uh, home there that's waiting to be placed in, in, well, it will be beautiful after we paint it. So um, that's waiting to be placed in one of our parks there. So we're already ahead of the game with, uh, and Karthik has also purchased a home that's waiting to be placed in one of the Missouri um, communities. Uh, our community managers, we have an incentive program for them to source homes as well and, and, and to sell um, and to find, uh, find people to, to uh, purchase those. So we have dealer licenses in all of the states that we own communities in and Missouri will be no different. So that is an advantage for the number of homes we can sell per year, as well as discount uh, on orders for new homes, which are marked up for just the average folks that um, will walk in and, and wanna buy one. So I think it's, Brett, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but 10 to 15% cheaper for buying as a dealer versus a private person. Yeah, no, that's about right, depending on the manufacturer. Okay. Uh, and then, Karthik has been doing a great job of sourcing homes um, and thinking of kind of creative ways to, to find homes and place them in there. So I'll let him add on to, to this information. Yeah, um, so these mobile homes are not cheap. So these are in the range, anything between 800 to much more like uh, bigger, pri um, bigger prices than, than what we expect. And the reason why we chose Facebook Marketplace is we're already getting a cheaper price. 
and then we rehab with a little bit of capital and then we can sell to the tenants um, with, with a much bigger profit as well. So that's one of the key ways that we can increase our returns with just doing a little bit minimal work um, of rehabbing the place, which we are, many people know in the Bay Area with the old homes that what we have, we just do a rehab and then becomes a multi-million dollar uh, property. So it's exact same strategy that we want to apply on the mobile homes as well. And one of the creative ways that we're trying to do is experimenting with tiny homes. Because as you can see, given the current COVID timelines, getting these homes is also being, becoming more and more um, uh, cumbersome because um, people are not, uh, many people are buying these homes. Uh, mobile home communities are growing everywhere. So we want to create that kind of a strategy to see how it works. And obviously with the, all the infills that we are planning to do, we plan to experiment with this. And then if it flies, we could also do some more other improvements um, to get more tenants while just you know, you know, giving in a tiny home spot or even prefab homes that we're planning to experiment. So all these kind of places happening as we speak, and we are already in like uh, buying, purchasing homes as we talk. So we are in a good market um, to, to move from 68% from year zero to almost like 93% within year six or seven. So I think we are well within the target um, and we are pretty excited to infill these, uh, these spots. Thanks, Carl. Thinking quick time check. We've just got a couple more slides, so we'll be toward the end here in a second. So I wanted to show the Performa real quick. This is mostly because I think a lot of people like to download the deck and review it, so it's mostly for people to want to do that. Um, but a couple of things I want to point out. Firstly, Matt and I each kind of went in our own corners and did the underwriting on our own, and then we came back together and consulted each other. And um, what I liked about that is it was really nice to validate each other on, on how great of an opportunity this is. Um, it's always nice to have somebody to, to second guess your work and make sure that you're not missing anything major. So uh, definitely some great things there. Uh, again, like Matt mentioned before, the way we calculate NOI um, or net operating income is you'll take your total um, effective gross income, uh, which is this gray line, and then you'll subtract total operating expenses, um, which Matt actually builds in an extra 3% contingency just in case we're wrong. So all of these things are we've already added uh, percentages and have double checked and gotten bids and all that kind of stuff. And then we just add an extra contingency. Plus, by the way, we're forecasting heavy vacancy year one. So it's 20% vacancy year one. That actually is, uh, accounts to be 50% vacancy on our Springfield, the three parks up in Springfield, Fairfield, um, Cedar Lane, and uh, um, Suburban Acres. It, those will be 50% vacant from our expectation based on a lot of the turnaround we're doing. And then rolling metals will continue being just the normal five to 8%. So we're building in a ton of vacancy for first year. Um, and then you calculate the net operating income. And then below that is where you'll see debt coverage and then the potential, uh, the um, lease to own expenses and lease to own income. So uh, you'll see all that baked down into the net distributable cash flow at the bottom. Um, so partner partnership structure, for those of you that invested with us in Iowa, this is relatively similar to the partner structure up there with just a couple of differences. Um, the main things I wanna point out are, uh, we've switched this to, this is a 506B offering. What that means is that we can actually have a handful, it's about 30, up to 35 unaccredited investors um, that are able to invest in this, as well as unlimited number of accredited investors. Uh, we've also structured the returns differently where we're doing 70% of excess returns to members, 30% to uh, sponsors, and then above that 50-50 um, above the 20% IRR. Um, we also, the asset management fee, one thing I want to point out about that, it shows here on the Performa, so it's a 5% of revenue. And a few things this covers that um, I think are pretty pretty great. There are some expenses up here that you'll notice that we're in the T12 or the, 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 the seller's financials that came down quite a bit for us because, for example, with administrative, this would include tenant screening, uh, bookkeeping software, things like that, which we cover from our asset management fee. So some of these expenses are actually covered for, by us from our partnership. Um, and then the asset management fee also helps us pay for travel and things like that that help, help us come out and make sure we're operating the, the project. Um, so uh, an example of 100K investment, if you invest $100,000, the price per share for that is a, a dollar. So it'll be 100,000 shares as well. Um, that would actually equal to be about 8% of the total equity required. Uh, so 
one of the things that I think we mentioned in the email that I first sent out is we only need about $1.2 million in equity, which is much lower than we've needed in most projects. And the main reason for that is because we've gotten amazing financing terms, which I'll show on the next slide. But I want to I want to point that out because we've actually between a few people that have already made reservations as well as ourselves, because we're going to be we we always like to invest 10 to 20 percent personally into this. Uh, we're already about halfway to that 1.2 target. So if you're interested, I would recommend reaching out to us soon just to let us know that you're at least interested, even with just a soft commitment. And I'll talk in a second about how to do that. Um, oh, depreciation expense. There was a question about taxes uh, earlier. I wanted to just talk real quick. So Ryan talked about the cost segregation study we do. Um, there's also, uh, that'll give you depreciation expenses up front, and then we have a lot of other passive cash flow that's just taxed differently and more favorably than the normal earned income. Um, the budget, so total sources and uses add up to be about 5.7 million. Um, and this, by the way, assumes we're buying the Fairfield uh, pro project because I wanted to have that baked in here. So we have debt of 4 million from the bank, equity from all of us uh, and investors, 1.2 million. And then we have the Rolling Meadows uh, seller is actually doing a $500,000 seller financing terms for us, um, which is again, part of the reason why we don't need as much equity, which is fantastic. Cause when you do seller financing, you just pay an interest rate. You don't have to share the upside, which leaves more upside for all of us, uh, which I'm sure all of you appreciate. Um, so on the uses standpoint, so we're, our total purchase price across the four communities, including Fairfield is 4.1. Uh, we'll have a 76,000 in operating reserve, reserves. 80, uh, 874 goes to our renova renovation budget. Um, this will cover things like the asphalt, um, landscaping, uh, the city sewer conversion for suburban acres. We've also baked in $150,000 into this for the rolling metals wastewater treatment plant. Just in case, we actually have nothing planned for that because it's in good working order, but just in case something happens, we have that in our renovation budget. Um, home purchasing and rehab, uh, 400,000. Most of this will go to home purchasing. Um, Brandon, who again is on the call, isn't that expensive. He's not going to take 400,000 from us to rehab homes. Um, at least he better not. Uh, just kidding. This is mostly for buying new homes, but this will also cover and give us a kickstart to rehab the existing six or seven homes that are in the portfolio. So we have closing costs. This is an estimate from what the bank financing costs will be. This is also an estimate for due diligence and third-party reports like uh, Alta surveys and uh, environmental reports, appraisals, things like that. And then the acquisition fee that I mentioned back here for this 3% as it be, to be 123, this, this covers really a lot of our time and the extra excess uh, risk that we take on by signing on the loan, things like that. Um, Brett, so, Brett yeah. somebody yep. asked about the rate on seller financing. Um, Ryan, do you remember exactly? I think it's 5% is what I want to say. Yeah, 5%. Yeah, it is. Thanks, Matt. Um, and then the debt, we're getting uh, just above 4% on the interest. And then another question, how much skin in the game equity or principles putting in? Uh, so we are contributing 250 personally. So we're taking up about 20% of the 1.2 million. Okay, cool. So this is our last slide. I do have a, a Q&A question at the end. If there aren't questions, I can kind of go through those. But uh, the orange box and this timeline essentially say the same things. I just kind of put them in differently in case that, you know, all of us learn a little differently uh, or visualize things differently. So timeline-wise, we're doing the webinar now. I will send out all the investor materials in the next two days. Uh, so they'll be live for you to review, download, and then start to sign once you're ready. And then we just ask that you make your soft commitment in the reservation or in the, in the portal by the 4th so that we kind of have an idea. Um, I, I actually expect this to, to fill relatively quickly since we're already at half, the halfway point. So if you are interested, I recommend, again, like I said before, reach out soon. Um, funding deadline, we're doing August 20th. This is a little different offering because we are closing on two of the parks at the end of August, which is why we need the funding uh, deadline to be August 20th. But we're closing on Rolling Meadows August, September 4th, uh, 14th. And then I didn't even put Fairfield on here. We'll close October 6th, I think is the closing date on that. So we'll be closing on them at kind of stages and we'll, we'll let you know as we close on each. Um, but deadline can be August 20th for that. 
So the summary of next steps is really you need to have an account on our investor portal. So you can just go to suncrestcap.com. And if you click on invest, you can either register or log in from there. Um, and then once you do that, if you click on invest up at the top left uh, window, in fact, um, I can show you all how to do that in just a moment, but, and then you'll review and sign the, the operating documents, fund your investment, and then you'll start invest, enjoying monthly distribution six months later. Um, Brett, any questions coming up on that yet? Yeah. Um, and something that, uh, so the term of the loans, which is pretty, it's pretty unheard of for especially the vacancy that we have to infill. So Brett. Yeah. So what, what's super unique about this, which, I mean, honestly, I've, I've talked to a ton of lenders and this is just crazy unique, um, is we're getting 80% loan to cost. Meaning what that means is they're lending on the value of the parks as completed. So they're covering 80% of our capital projects as well. The reason for that is they, this, this lender is based out of Springfield, uh, Missouri. They have been loaning uh, or they have held the financing for Rolling Meadows for several years. Um, and they are really familiar with Rolling Meadows. They like Rolling Meadows a lot. They're based in Springfield. So they're also familiar with these communities. And they were just really liked our business plan and wanted to see us uh, succeed with this turnaround project. So they're giving us again, 80% and only charging 4%. The best I've ever heard that's come close to that has been bridge financing that can have its own risks and is a lot more expensive. Um, so just really, we're pretty excited about that. I don't, I'm not noticing any other questions on that. So I'll kind of move forward. Um, so I'm going to go through this quick Q&A that we have that we kind of came up with ourselves ahead of time. And then if there's some time for people, I can kind of show you how to do the, the reservation online. So the first question is, can I invest through a 1031 exchange? This is a relatively common question we get. We can do a 1031 exchange um, for sure. The challenge is that there's some extra overhead and we have to kind of set up unique uh, legal uh, structure for it. So we do require 250 for minimum investment to do that. Um, and then questions about what are my risks if I'm a limited partner? So as the title suggests, the risks are limited to your investment. So if you invest 100,000, the worst case scenario, you would lose $100,000. You're not gonna get, no one's gonna come after you for any kind of lawsuit. No one's gonna come after you for any kind of collection on debt or anything like that. That's why uh, we, we take on that risk as a general partners where we're personally guaranteeing the loans um, and, and take on all that risk. Um, obviously, we have zero plans to have any kind of <laughs> lawsuits or bankruptcies, but just to clarify, that would be the worst case scenario that you wouldn't have to worry about any of that. Um, what will debt be used for? I think I already answered that pretty well with the financing and the CapEx budget. Okay. Uh, one question is, uh, what's the term of the, uh, term of the loans? Um, they're 10 year terms. Uh, it, it's a 10 year term. Well, so the seller financing is three years. Uh, we need to pay off the seller financing within three years. The uh, debt from the lender is 10 years and it's a 25 year amortization schedule with one year of interest only. And then the next question is the acquisition and guarantee goes back to the partnership, correct? And that's the effective skin in the game is about 10%. And also the follow-up is, isn't the property the collateral and guarantee for the loan or is it the personal guarantee? Yep, it's a good question. So the the 20-ish, that 250 that I'm talking about is truly coming out of our pocket. That uh, the acquisition fee comes back to, uh, to reinvest or reimburse us for some of our expenses, some of our time, but it obviously is also incentive for us on the work we do. Um, and so I, you could subtract it if you were trying to do the effective get in the game but i don't i don't, I don't think it totally works that way because um, it doesn't straight come back to us um and then the guarantee okay so the way that works we do actually personally they're full recourse loans so we do have to personally guarantee them so to get to a point where a property doesn't require a full recourse loan you generally have to have very high occupancy loans and i did i kind of skipped over this part but we we put together here on the business plan what our physical occupancy forecast is. So today we're at 68%. This actually is just uh, Cedar Lane, Suburban and Rolling Meadows. We didn't update this to include Fairfield. Um, so 68% with those three, 
And then in year four, we expect to get to 89%. To get to the point where you can refinance into something that's uh, guaranteed by Fannie or Freddie, for example, that would be like an agency loan that doesn't require recourse, you have to have be at least 85 to 90% physically occupied um, to even touch that. So anything below that, we do have to personally guarantee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on the acquisition fee, we, we already have thousands of dollars sunk into the due diligence uh, part of this uh, project. So it, the majority of that goes to reimburse those costs. Okay, so I am going to hope this works. So if I go to suncrestcap.com, I just wanna kind of show the process here. I click on invest and then log in. Um, so if you don't already have account, you'll do the registration. In this case, I do. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. And then this is what it'll look like as a when you come uh, in here. So if you're interested, I've already made an investment contribution. Um, so you would just come in and like, if you were going to do a new one, it would look like this. You'd click invest up here, hit invest again. And this is, to, to this point so far where I'm about to go, it's just a soft commitment. You're not actually like making the funding or anything. Um, so here I will have the documents uploaded before you're actually looking at it. So you'll just confirm you've seen the documents and then you can choose whether you're going to do it yourself or an LLC, or you can add a trust. So this is where you would add a new profile to determine how you want to invest and then choose the amount you want to invest. And then once you get through this, let's see, oh, I'm missing stuff here. So anyway. I'm not going to show that because that's got some personal information on it. But if you hit next, then it'll just save it and you can see the documents and you don't need to continue going from there. At this point, we'll, we'll get your reservation um, and that'll be captured. But then later on to meet that timeline, you'll want to sign the documents and fund the investment by August 20th. Okay, I think, did we get through all the questions? So for any other questions people have, you're welcome to come off mute too and talk if anybody's got anything. Uh, or just throw things in the chat either way. So maybe we can touch back on the returns taxed. Uh, maybe we can talk about the depreciation assets that we give for, for year one, um, Brett. Um, sure. So if we go back to the returns. So year one, and we, we uh, generally will try to do this as late in the year as possible. We'll do a cost segregation study. What that means is uh, it it's actually it has to be a certified cost segregation st specialist that is uh, very familiar, usually their CPA, but they're at the very least an engineer. So they're often both an engineer and a CPA. And if they're not both, they have someone they work with that's the other one. Um, and they literally go through all of your costs and they segregate the schedule. So what's, what's interesting about this is it's actually better for mobile home parks than it is for normal multifamily or commercial or, or industrial because your general depreciation schedule on other uh, types of assets is usually around 27 and a half years. So that means if you buy something for a million dollars, you would just divide it by 27 and a half. And then every year for 27 and a half years, you get to depreciate that every year. Um, so when you do a cost segregation study, it basically takes the different types of expenses. So for example, tile is segregated differently than wood and they can be scheduled differently. So depending on what it is, it could actually be, be accelerated all the way to the first year. And if it's not accelerated to the first year, then it'll be on the normal schedule. And for the normal schedule for a mobile home park is actually 15 years, not 27 and a half. So even the, the highest uh, term for the depreciation is still better than multifamily because you get to depreciate more. So generally we anticipate at least 60% of your investment will come back as a, as a paper loss year once so if you invest 100,000, and I had that on a slide later on. If you invest 100,000, we expect you to receive a paper loss of 60,000 year one because of that depreciation expense. What's great about that is you'll notice that you're, it's going to take you a few years to catch up on that loss. So you'll be able to carry that forward and be able to um, write that off until you catch up to 60,000. The other thing to keep in mind is um, you're getting return of capital, not return on capital. So when it's return of capital, that's not taxed either because it's your own money coming back. So you really don't start to see that tax until it's, until it's classified as return on capital. And then you still have your 60,000 depreciation expense to offset that. So it's super favorable from a tax perspective. Um, and then as we talked about before, you can always do a 1031 exchange after this into another investment to continue to defer any, tax, any taxes.
Karthik, do you have anything you wanted to touch there that you were um, thinking specifically? Um, I think that should be good. Um, and then also another question for minimum investment, Brett. Yeah, so the minimum investment, it's also shown at the end, is $50,000. Uh, so that'll be right here. So, and this deck will be available on our uh, on that investment portal too, so you can download afterward. Hey, Brett, I don't, I don't know if it necessarily matters, but um, I know there's been a couple of questions in the chat about the skin in the game. And I, 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 I have no problem saying to the group that like, I know that I intend to personally invest at least 100K myself into this project. So if anyone you know, cares. So I thought I'd share that with the, with the group. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Yeah. Uh, so another question is, what's the entry cap and the uh, exit cap? Yep, so the entry cap, so the exit cap, uh, Matt touched on when we were talking about uh, underwriting. We assume at both refinance and exit, a 7% cap rate, which by the way is really high. Um, it's generally, you're generally seeing most mobile home communities going for 6%, 5.5% in strong markets. So assuming a 7% cap is already a conservative cap rate. Um, that entry, it's it's really challenging to actually get a cap rate on a couple of these because they're not cash flowing, uh, they're turnaround projects. So Rolling Meadows, so this is what I was looking for. Rolling Meadows, we're buying at an 8% cap rate. Cedar Lane and Suburban Acres are more like 7% cap rates, but they have really crazy, 7% cap rates on actuals, by the way. These are based on today's numbers. They have really crazy financials where the manager is making like 30% of, of uh, revenue, which is just, about 30 times more than they should be paid. <laughs> um, things like that, that immediately the Performa cap rate is going to skyrocket from there. Uh, Fairfield Acres is not cash flowing. So there's not really an actual cap rate there because again, these are all three turnaround projects. Mm -hmm. Brett, I don't think we mentioned it, but all of, all of these mobile home communities were sourced um, off market in, yes. in a variety of different ways. I, yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. So they're all off market. They're four different communities from three different sellers. The only shared seller is between Spurb Makers and Cedar Lane. That's one seller. And um, what's great about the way we found these is that the average purchase price per pad is about 14,000. So to give you an idea, up in Des Moines, the Des Moines area, we just bought um, a portfolio at about 22,000 and we were ecstatic at 22,000 a pad. So at 13,000 a pad, some of them are lower than that even. Um, it's just unheard of. And you can't get the zoning for that cost, let alone all the infrastructure that's already there. So um, really we're buying at a really great point. And then once they're stabilized, they'll be worth more than double what we're buying them for. And just to add Firefield, we are getting a 10K per, uh, per pad, so. Yep. Um, and one other question, will you refinance after year three on the seller financing park alone? Um, if so, do you expect a capital call to cover the down payment or do we ex expect to meet the loan to value on the new loan with the increased value of the property? Yeah, good question. So I put in the plan that we're going to be refinancing year five because that's the latest that we'll be refinancing for some of these. So for example, Fairfield will actually get refinanced within two years. Um, and so when we do the cash out refinance on that, that is actually the money we'll be able to pay back the uh, seller financing on. The other thing is the seller financing is largely, so for Fairfield, for example, because it's not cash flowing, we have to have a higher reserve for that. Um, we have to even uh, escrow some amount for it. And all of that will come from that seller financing we're getting from Rolling Meadows. So generally, when you add a new community to your portfolio, you're going to have to have more money you bring in. In this case, it's the same 1.2 million, whether we buy Fairfield or not. Um, because we're able to leverage that seller financing from Rolling Meadows to buy the Fairfield Park. And then as soon as we implement the business plan within that 18 to 24 months, we'll refinance out of that. And then what is the expected financing terms on the refi? Matt, what do you assume there for your refi terms? Um, I can just, I can just yeah. answer it too. It's, we generally I think assume- it's set, Yeah. Uh, it was a uh, 70% 70 per, 70 loan to value uh, and um, sorry. 
Yep. And yeah. Usually four and a half percent interest seven rate. Cap rate. Yeah. And four and a half inter percent interest rate. Yep. Cool. Four and a half, 70 percent loan to value, 25 year AM. But keep in mind, uh, we'll keep most of that money will be escrowed and not actually spent. So as soon as the, we wouldn't even technically have to refinance to be able to pay back that 500,000 because we'd get it back from the escrow. And I think that I, another point to make in year five, a, a lot of these parks would qualify for um, much better terms because of the occupancy. So. Exactly. This, this is where that cash out refinance, the expectation there is that we will be doing agency debt, uh, which we still, agency debt you at this point is sub 3%. And is usually about 75 to 80% loan to value, but we still always assume 70% loan to value and 4.5% uh, interest rate. Okay, I'm not seeing other questions come in. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and wrap it. Um, if other people have questions, uh, we can stay on in, in case there's other people who want to kind of stick around, but I also want to be respectful of other people's time. What I'm going to do is tomorrow I'll send out an email to the group uh, with this recording in case you wanted to go back and play anything, um, as well as the documents will be uploaded and I'll, I'll email uh, an announcement about that in the next year or two as well. So with that, thank you all again for joining us. We're again, as hopefully you heard from all of us, we're super excited about this opportunity. We, we sourced them off market, got really great deals. I think bringing them together as a packaged uh, portfolio when we go to sell these is just gonna be a huge intrinsic value increase in and of itself, but all of the extra value we're adding here is gonna just continue to increase that as well. So we're super stoked about this and uh, looking forward to working with all of you. Hope you have a great night. Thanks guys. Thank you.